you, Alan. I'm going to use this. Thanks. Yes, as I'm, am I live here? Can you hear me? Yep. Um, as, I, as I'm very fond of saying, I'm one of the very few people in the world who has worked with both the FBI and the Grateful Dead. <laughs> And it was actually um, quite a difficult thing for me to decide to work with the FBI back when I started uh, because I went from having a folder on me to working with them. And, um, but I worked with the Behavioral Analysis Unit and they are the folks that are made famous by criminal minds. As a matter of fact, my uh, FBI partner is the technical advisor for that. And I got involved with some of their cases, and especially the, the unit that deals with sex, serial sex crimes against children. Uh, I figured they were, they were a good bunch to be able to support. And they also, during the Bush administration, went and testified before Congress to complain about the treatment of interrogatees at Guantanamo during the Bush administration and they complained about the terrible things that the military and the CIA were doing. The FBI had been there interrogating the Guantanamo prisoners before, and they were not pulling out their fingernails or waterboarding them, and they were actually getting very useful information as well. So anyway, um, usually I begin with a resume of uh, my uh, legal qualifications, and I'll talk about that, but this being a polyglot conference, uh, I was born into a Spanish-speaking neighborhood in Brooklyn. Matter of fact, I was the only English speaker in my first grade class. One of the first phrases I learned, because the teacher only spoke English, there were no bilingual aides, it was just an English-speaking teacher, me and 20 Puerto Rican kids. So one of the first phrases I learned was, que dijo la bruja? <laughs> you, and I didn't know what that meant either. It means, you know, uh, what did the witch say now? So uh, I still, I studied Spanish and French in college. I managed a panaderia repoteria in San Juan. But I can barely speak Spanish now because I studied Swahili so long. And in the middle of all this, I discovered linguistics. I mean, many of us are polyglots because we love language. What better also to study linguistics, which tells us how language works. And uh, it was fantastic, I, and that's what I have all my degrees in. So during my undergraduate days, I wanted to take a new language, but as I say here, all the intro level courses at Columbia were Monday through Friday in those days. And out of 55 languages, they were all taught Monday through Friday except for Swahili. <laughs> and as I love to tell my Swahili students these days, when I walked into class the first day, I couldn't have found Africa on a map. But I wound up living there for seven, eight years, and um, it was a great experience. Also, Swahili, I just fell in love with it. It has 15 grammatical genders. The negative tenses are different than the positive tenses. Uh, and, and on like that, just fantastic. So I studied Swahili, I got a Fulbright Fellowship to go to Kenya for one year and I lived there for seven years. I studied a lot of other Bantu languages. I ran a school out in the hinterland, an eastern province uh, with the Akamba uh, people. And because I represented the students in my school, I was forced to sit on the elders council uh, of the uh, Katagakai, which means dangerous forest location, elders. I was a junior elder at the time. And uh, I just couldn't get enough Kikamba because, and I'm sure a lot of us have had this experience, you go to a place, you're trying to learn the local language, but there's some other language that it's so much easier for them to communicate with you in, right? Like my Dutch friend, a uh, guy who uh, studied Dutch. He could never get any uh, uh, Dutch people to speak Dutch to them because they all spoke such good English. And it was the same with my elders. They spoke post pidgin Swahili, but they just said, come on, Buona Robert, let's just speak Swahili. So I never really learned Kikamba very well. So when I uh, left 
Kenya the first time, I decided to go to Bangkok and study Thai because I wanted to go from an agglutinative, super heavy grammar language to this isolating tonal language. And, and it was great. And I've just kept on with Lao and all sorts of stuff. But I only put Swahili in English here. As you know, if you don't practice, it's hard. So in, a, in England, once you're, now we'll go to the forensic linguistics. Uh, once you're qualified, you can testify. But here, every single time uh, a court case happens, you have to prove yourself again. And of course, the other side never wants you to testify. So these are some of the things that we adduce to qualify. And one of the reasons I bring this up is because it's a difficult thing. You can testify without a doctorate. You can testify without all sorts of stuff if you're an expert on a specific um, topic, but it's a lot easier because, as I say, they fight like mad. And the last sentence here is very important. We're dealing with language. The other side always says, judge, you speak English. The jury speaks English, you see, as if that meant that they were able to analyze it. And again, since we're polyglots, we know just how much mechanics there are in language because we've compared them. Um, I started the only graduate program or undergraduate program in forensic linguistics in the Western Hemisphere. My British friends have three programs. There's one in Spain and Barcelona. Um, we also have this institute, which is our research arm and special projects, and uh, a private consulting group. And something we're extremely proud of, uh, we, I kept getting letters from prisoners asking me, could I help them? They never wrote that confession that put them in jail. Uh, they didn't write the text that the police say they did and put them on death row. I was just in Waco, Texas a couple of months ago on a case like that. The original Innocence Project from Yeshiva Law School mostly does DNA, but nobody was doing language evidence. So uh, I felt hopelessly unable to navigate appeals, so I teamed up with a great um, uh, law professor, a constitutional law, a guy named Eric Friedman at Hofstra, and now we have an ongoing um, forensic linguistics capital case. Mostly, we'll give, of course, first call to people who are actually on death row right now. So forensic linguistics is a combination of two words that nobody knows what they mean. It's really great. Uh, and we're not only forensic, we really do all sorts of legal stuff, but it became known as forensic. So it's the application of linguistics to these things. What, you might ask yourself, in the law is not language. You testify, you have uh, decisions, you supposedly confess, you're interrogated all with language. And yet people don't analyze it scientifically. And that's what we're trying to do. So we help people who are not linguists to gain the maximum intelligence. Expert witnesses, their task, as opposed to fact witnesses, are to help the trier of fact, the judge, jury, whatever, to interpret the evidence before them. And if they're not experts in fingerprints or DNA, an expert comes and explains. And now we're making a lot of inroads so that we explain language evidence to people. Just in the past 10 years, I've collaborated with every single one of the uh, categories that you see on the slide and many more. As I keep saying, what in, lang what in the law is not language? Everything from uh, patents and trademarks to multiple homicides. These are some of the outfits that I've participated in training, including special units, that's all we're allowed to call them in the UK and Canada and the US and Denmark now. And a lot of defense as well as prosecution. I'm very lucky, most forensic linguists and a lot of experts are either defense or prosecution. Um, and I came in through the case that you guys are holding, 
that Hummert case so, into with the prosecution. So I'm hired by both sides, and it's actually very, very good, I must say, for my understanding of the way everything works. So we do a lot of civil cases, too. An English contract between Turkey and Turkmenistan brought me to Paris to testify in front of the World Bank. I was Apple's expert against Microsoft and Amazon. Some criminal counterterrorism intelligence cases. This is again just in the, like the past two years. Look at the second to the bottom, perjury and other language crimes. That's what Roger Shy, the greatest of forensic linguists in the United States and my mentor, he wrote a great book called Language Crimes. Realize that there are so many crimes that you can commit by uttering language. Perjury, solicitation of murder, uh, attempted bribery. Very, very interesting. And how are these analyzed in the courts? Well, not scientifically. So we have developed many, many methods of dispassionately analyzing them. My FBI partner and I, as we would do training, we always said language can solve and prevent crimes. And every time we would give a presentation or training to agents or detectives, somebody would come out of the audience and say, could you guys look at these letters we found at the scene of the crime? It never occurred to us they might be able to be helpful. So in our intelligence gathering, and this again won't be a surprise to you all, we can help identify all these characteristics of the person who wrote or spoke. And what we can do is narrow the suspect pool whether it's corporate intelligence, whether it's counterintelligence, very, very useful. Uh, that's the John Benet Ramsey case, which I actually got dragged into when um, a guy named Carr w came out of Thailand and claimed to have been involved with uh, the little girl's death. And I analyzed the ransom note, I analyzed his language, and I said, uh, there was no connection. Everybody went berserk. The people who hired me begged me to say that there was a connection. Handwriting experts said there was a connection. And then the DNA came and there was no connection. He was just trying to get out of Thailand one step ahead of the cops and the uh, Boulder police and uh, DA helped him. All right, this is a very famous case within forensic linguistics, which means it's not famous at all, but um, <laughs> This is a well-known example for aficionados. And not only are we gonna look at what is always looked at, because this is all over the web, but some other stuff. This is just a little sample menu of the kinds of things that we need to look at when we analyze. But the most important one is the bottom one. Unlike most linguistic analyses, when we are dealing with ransom notes or anything that somebody might not willingly write his own name on the bottom, we're gonna to have to expect disinformation. So this is my transcription from a crumpled up piece of, um, you know, uh, brown paper bag. This is what the ransom note was written on. So what do we see here instantly? Come on. Misspellings. A lot of misspellings. And what are the misspellings? K's for C's. So uh, you were always testing competing hypotheses. Maybe the guy's underlying language always uses K's instead of C's. Oh, but wait a minute, then there's Carlson, there's Cash. So what's going on, you see? Uh, uh, what are some other irregularities or non-standardisms that you see? Daughter's misspelled. What else is misspelled? What? Yeah, yeah. yeah, right, right. So there, there's a lot that, uh, you know, okay. Um, but what is, what is spelled correctly? The 10,000, you have the comma instead of the A. Yeah. 
well, okay, well, well this is America, so it would make sense. <laughs> right, but very good. That's exactly the kind of detail that we look for. And, and, and hold on, because the next few slides after this example, we're gonna get into that kind of thing. Precious. precious. Yeah. I can't spell precious. <laughs> so this is somebody who can spell precious, okay? Now what else? What else is telling us that maybe this is not somebody who can't even spell cops. The lines are um, all put together like everyone in the group feeling off. It's not on the same line. Yeah, but that my maid have masked when I did the transcription. But very, very good. And, and at these stages, there is no detail that is not going to be useful. Because what happens is we're profiling now, narrowing the suspect pool. And then if there is a suspect, we will have all these things ready to compare to exemplars. Yes? Put it in the trash can. Put it in. It's like instead of all these other expletives, just do it. Come okay. On. Right. Okay. Diaper. Diaper. What else, guys? Devil strip. Devil strip. See, you're all good readers, and that's why you didn't notice devil strip, because devil strip didn't mean anything to you. It's not an oversight. It shows that you know how to read, because the better reader you are, you are more trained to ignore instantly. I mean, you know, he had a while to look at this. It did only take him a minute, but usually uh, it doesn't. And you're going fast, so you don't see devil strip. So what is devil strip? Part of the graph between the... Oh, go away, you're from Akron. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, so Roger Shy, my mentor, right? Is that true? It's true. So Roger, Roger takes a look at this. Now they're used to us taking five weeks. You know the thing I gave you guys, the handout? It took us five weeks, you're gonna get five minutes. But, uh, so Roger looks at it and almost instantly says, Did, do you have on your suspect list a well-educated person from Akron, Ohio? Wow. And they said, oh Roger, does he walk with a limp? Does he uh, have a, a ripped left sleeve? You know, uh, Sherlock Holmes, right? And he said, just look. We're hearing some little kid yell, Daddy. <laughs> Having children myself, my ears perk up, right, from the old days. OK, so what other markers were there, right in front of your eyes, that would have told us that this is not somebody who can spell cops? And this is, I always use this when I'm training uh, agents or, or defense lawyers, but mostly agents. It's that. People aren't trained to analyze language. They're trained to use language. And just like with the reading, it means we ignore stuff. We take the lowest hanging fruit, we assume people are cooperating with us, and bang, we go off to the races. But linguists have to slow down and try to peel off, even though it's right in front of us. Yes? Do you ever, ever want for something? Yes, it, it reads very nicely. And wah! Hmm. Which is not useful. Hmm. <laughs> it's funny, I was in London training uh, people before, uh, well, anyway. Here it's a high tech place and, you know, that happened and these three guys come up and they look at it and they kick it, you know? And uh, you figure James Bond is gonna fly in, but it doesn't happen. But here it does, all right, thank you, okay. Punctuation, look at the punctuation, it's perfect. That's right. It's perfect. See, again, that was something Roger noticed instantly too. Good. More punctuation, take a look at that, guys. Is this writer likely a L1 speaker of English or French? English, why? Yeah, because you don't have the spaces. That's true, but uh, there's other things that might be count, run counter to that. I would say the apostrophes. Well, now remember, there, I, again, I'm giving you guys 30 seconds, or not even, to, to look at this. Take a look, read it to yourself. Who says, come on. The French pronunciation, the, 
in English, we'd say French pronunciation. We wouldn't say the French pronunciation, see? And also notice punctuations, which certainly isn't native English. It isn't particularly French, but it sure ain't native English. See, that was what I was talking about. Look at this one. This is from a real threat case that we had. I challenge that you have the right to have her to yourself. I've known her since a very long time myself. Yes. What's the matter with since? Not English. Not English. What would be English? Or since 1997 or something, right? Or for a long time. Absolutely. I knew you guys would be good. Depuis longtemps, maybe, or maybe some other language, but it sure wasn't English. We had one French speaker in our suspect pool, and it really accelerated the, uh, the analysis. I missed it. My partner got it. <laughs> so now we go from profiling to authorship. And this is the case that you all are holding. This poor woman was murdered. Threatening stalker letters, and you have one of the, the, the most complete stalker letter was written. The woman was killed. Then during the course of the ensuing investigation, a serial killer self-professed, wrote letters to the cops and the newspaper. So the police came to me and said, what can I tell them about whoever wrote this? So again, I mean, when you have five minutes, we took far more than five weeks. But take a look now. And remembered this information. Yes, the first letter. Well, the first letter, I should be more precise, was put on the windshield of her husband's car because it's written to the husband. Author or well, that's one of the questions. And one of the reasons it was important is because the judge was balking at giving the cops all of the writings of their suspects because it's an invasion of privacy. So the judge has to be convinced that there is a good reason to do that. This is what the stalker one actually looked like, and it's reproduced perfectly, I mean, uh, precisely. And then this is what the uh, serial killer one looked like, written, handwritten, and I have kept some of the features in my transcription. Let's start with this one, the serial killer 
letter. Look at the difference in correct, for want of a better word, grammar. Okay, where? Yep. And cops have no idea how easy it is to pin husband, pin it on the husband. Okay, now go above that and see if you find any of that. Mm. Well, you could say either one. I mean, and be quote unquote grammatical, right? You have that complementizer uh, deletion if you want. That's one of the things we use very often in authorship cases. Good though. It gets worse as you go down, right? Do not ask me why this is, but it happens all the time. <laughs> I mean, they start out grammatical, they get near the end and they say, I better dumb this down. <laughs> I, I mean, couldn't they rewrite it? And this happens in case after case, I'm not kidding. It, it's, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> now, by the way, see, you guys are great linguists, but when I do this for murder detectives, they read the first line and then they are rolling in the aisles. They're just laughing their heads off. As my uh, partner, Benji Wald said, oh, he left out a clause. He should have said, I killed Charlene Hummer, not her husband, because I'm not her husband, you see? Because they were getting very close to the husband. And this is what's called in FBI talk, a POMIC. P-O-M-I-C, you know, it's the government they love, uh, initialisms uh, or acronyms. Um, so that's post-offense manipulation of investigation communications. In other words, dragging a red herring across the trail. And we have case after case like this. You get too close to somebody, some information comes. In one case we had in New Jersey that I worked with the FBI on, uh, a woman, according to the jury, did do all these things. She, um, she drugged her husband, then she shot him in the head, then she cut him into pieces, and she packed him in three pieces of matching luggage and threw him in the Atlantic Ocean. But she didn't do a very good job, and he rose to the surface, came in. Uh, a plastic bag expert from Princeton showed that she had given her brother-in-law, a lot of her now dead husband's clothing, in a plastic bag that came from the same lot that the body parts were wrapped in. Yeah, and you know, then and she had searched for how do you kill people, what chloral hydrate you need, uh, gun stores in New Jersey. So be careful about that if you're planning anything ever. <laughs> um, and in the middle of the trial, a letter was sent to uh, the court with the actual shells that were from the bullets that killed the husband. And the letter was trying to inculpate, make look guilty, the defendant's sister-in-law who now had her kids. And it's very important that you have to be very believable and you have to give the cop something that'll make you believe that you did it, right? So that's why those bullets were in there. But this one was funny because I thought that she was killed with a dog collar and, and she was strangled so hard that a piece of the dog collar made an imprint in her neck that the uh, medical examiner just matched perfectly. And I asked the cops about this and they said, huh, yeah, well, don't know. But eventually we all figured it out. One of the things that was linking the chief suspect, who was of course her husband, was the dog collar. So he wanted to drag the cops away from the idea of a dog collar, so that's why he has a white nylon rope. So do you see any underlying similarities? It's really ridiculous for me to ask you because, as I say, it took us months. But I'll ask anyway. Similarities between the two letters? Yeah. Oh. Well, look, they're both in English. Mm -hmm. 
That narrows it down a bit, right? Yep. Right, and, but now as investigators, let's remember that there are different purposes of these letters, see? One is a bit over the top on information that's damning to her. Although I must say forensic psychologists always point out to me that if you wanted to call a woman all these bad sexual things, you could have done a lot worse than in this letter. See, they, they see these all the time, I mean, just, you know, barrage. And again, that supported the theory, maybe it was the husband, you know. But, um, so that's a very literate thing. And the other one is, you know, handwritten, bye-bye for now, John. But you're 100% right, of course. Yes? Very good question, I should have told you that. Uh, the first trial was 2006, we, he was tried again 2012, so I think this is around 2004, so good 10 years ago. What are you looking at? Well, the stalker letter, I'm assuming this was done at that time on a computer as opposed to a typewriter. It was. So the computer uh, word processing program would probably have spell check and other Could be. devices that Could be. But it, it's a pretty well written though, right? I'm sorry, I didn't mean. That's what I'm saying as compared to the other Yes, letters, yes, that's true. True, but you know, maybe he's dumbing down too. Um, and, and in the, uh, just one sec, also everybody look for something that might give us an idea as to his occupation. Yes, back there. There are, that's a very good um, thing to look at. There are other phrases, for example, how he characterizes in the voice of the uh, rock guy, uh, a, um, uh, she was a piece, you know, and stuff. That's also an older uh, phrase. Yes? Yes? Yeah, it, it's true. It, there's a, a big similarity like punchlines, uh, summaries, uh, intro lines, yeah. Speak up, or can we get a mic? It's very nice of him to give all this info, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. First letter, assuming that this is supposed to be the same person. Well, this is one of the, these, we're testing these hypotheses. In the first letter, he couldn't have killed her soon enough. In the second letter, he's sorry he killed her. Okay, true. But you're looking at the content, which we can't believe at all. But it's true, the content can also reveal a lot of stuff. It's just that we can't believe it. See, and that's the first thing that a good language person does, is we read for content. What is he trying to tell us? But you have to always assume total disinformation too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. She said she, uh, the contract uh, serial letter, she said she wrote it to her husband and Detective Loper. Um, why would he think? Loper was the lead detective. Why would he write it to Detective Loper? Yeah, because he was trying to drag Loper away from, yes. Mm -hmm. um, did he break the yes. Break That's right. She wanted to break it off, so I broke her neck. See if you can find an example of something like that in the first letter. Yes, over here? Yes. Yes, it's, it's pretty educated stuff, yes. <laughs> right, well that could have been the computer, but yeah. And, and I was struck because of, it's funny, you know, I did my dissertation on Swahili and mostly I looked at the narrative aspects of Swahili, uh, the special tenses and everything. When I look at these, I see tremendous expertise in narrative. We go now, flashback, flash forward, back to now, step outside the storyline in both of these. And you do it so well that you're not even aware of it until you analyze it. Yes, back there you had something? Yes. Um, there were a lot, both letters have sort of staccato like uh, exclamations. Like, sorry it took so long. Or you were with the first one. Like, she wanted to break it up. Yep. So I broke her. 
Right, 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 yes. 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 No, he's not, he's not uh, dumbing down the first one. There's no reason for him to, see? Yeah, I think, anyway, yes? No, no, uh, back there and then you. Thank you. Could you stand up? Yes. Well, and, and it's a, a linking feature. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. And the longer one, it starts off, here's the proof that your wife is a slut, and then the last sentence is, so you see you want to fuck my wife is a slut, so it's very like five it's paragraph essay. Exactly. That's it. That's it. You got it, man. You went to the same school as I did. Yeah. Mm hmm mm hmm Okay. So you were saying, yeah, that the, the, um, the one you used by both of them, the first one is the, uh, uh, I would love to find out the whole thing that they were doing business in. Right. Okay. So those are the links. Right. Exactly. And we'll see those in a sec. That's hard, but you might have a point there. I would have to think about that. Yeah, and uh, the, this is also a really good indication. I have presented this, these two letters, 50 times, 70 times. Every single time, somebody comes up with something that never occurred to me before, and I spent you know, six weeks of my life rereading these miserable things. Yes, you? Yeah, I think that's, to, I think that's a distractor. Yeah, but it, it is a point, of course. And who knows, maybe he's not doing it on purpose, and maybe when you get the suspect's exemplars, he does that too. Right, and then he says Xmas uh, in the other one. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, okay. See, I didn't remember that, if I ever noticed it. Let's look at something that might tell us something about an occupation. Yeah, I don't think, uh, I, I'm talking about something that he's not doing on purpose, yes. Occupation? Yeah. Comes back to the area I'm thinking. No, that's content. I'm talking about linguistic now. Mm -hmm. I know. Because it's very easy to have done that. These things weren't secured. You know, you go and say, my aunt Mabel uh, took some photos. She asked me to pick them up, you know, and give them to, for her surprise party. Uh, that's a very, very common question and a good one. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's yes. Why? Give me something linguistic. Well, whatever you're seeing, it was right, because he's not exactly a cop. Go on. Okay, even more though. Yes? DET, -E yes. Now, he might have picked that up just because he was so thoroughly investigated, but it was, we'll see there's more of a link, yes. Okay, but all right, no, that, that's not bad at all. That's, that's not bad at all. No, there's something else. I'll give you a hint. It's two letters. Not cop. Other occupation. PC. PC. Who calls a computer a PC? Apple, I guess. <laughs> he was, the husband, was a computer expert for the state police. Yeah. Okay? Now, you know, you don't go and arrest somebody on the basis of this. All we're doing here first is getting a warrant. So now let's go to what got the warrant. Similar dialect, education level, complex narrative structure, complex time shifts. Still, 
So we've narrowed it down to all of the, what? What, Peter? Oh, did you have something to say? We'll get to that, hold that thought. I'm hurrying along so we don't run out of time, good. Okay, that, we had to name it something. I called up the keeper of all rhetorical devices at Brigham Young University, there's this fantastic uh, compendium, and I said, what is this called? First, of course, I did my normal due diligence. I walked across the hall to the Latin and Greek teachers, and I said, what's this called? And they said, gee, we don't know. So it was uncommon, you know? So. That was a, not a bad link, and he didn't even have a name for it, the guy from BYU. So I wrote that up, and they said, okay, here's all this guy's writing. Here's the ironic repetition, which we had said. I would have loved to have found out. A couple of days, sure, she made sure my fiance found out. She wanted to break it off, so I broke her neck. So here we go now with a very idiosyncratic link between these two letters and everything else. Negatives were sometimes contracted, positives were never contracted. I walk the jury through the green of the negatives, the red of the positives, and it comes out in the, his known documents, Zero out of 74 possibilities, whereas we have 15 and 25 in the negative. And in the two letters we just looked at, another zero in the lower left. This is a very, very interesting skewing. We never looked at uh, contractions before that, but we do all the time now, and we've never found this exact thing. Only Hummert to his detriment. He was tried twice, twice convicted. This was the uh, uh, case that was on TV last night, uh, this hour-long uh, uh, thing for 2020, and I was uh, being filmed for a documentary on the Discovery Channel on it. And we did the analysis of, God, a thousand emails or so. So just read this through. Yeah, baby was left in the dead mother's arms for hours and hours, but somebody came in because he, he had his mail left there and he found him. So the mom is on the left, the daughter's on the right, and the husband agreed, he admitted to having killed these people to protect his daughter. This is the boyfriend of the daughter, and she catfished him. She made believe she was a CIA agent named Chris. And she told, as in the voice of Chris, both her mom and Jamie, that these people should be killed and that the CIA had their backs. Never occurred to him why a CIA agent would use Janelle's Facebook pages to communicate with him. But if you want to believe something, anybody who's been the you know, victim of a con artist, later you say, how could I have believed this? Jamie was in love with Janelle. Not on the show, as Janelle was sending him pictures of herself, sans uh, clothing, and uh, really trying to inveigle him. That means naked. <laughs> so these were some of the most unique, I mean, we just had dozens and dozens of same series in the question documents, the unknown ones, and the known ones. For example, beginning with a single quotation mark and ending with a double question mark in the moms and in some of the Q documents, the question documents, the subject documents. An asterisk, sometimes one, two, or three, to mark an aside in parentheses, no less. I mean, that's pretty unique, you see. 
in addition to all sorts of other things like beginning a sentence with and. Hmm. Oh, hey, yeah, great. But we fight back. Yeah, one minute. That's okay. That's fine. That's fine. Thanks. So we have, uh, this is one of the things that we had and we gave to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation they used with the jury. Sorry, I have to go through it so quickly. Very, very interesting idiosyncrasies. So the last one is three bomb threats to this one house in Beverly Hills. Quick. Well, who knows, right? Uh, the bees are big, uh, et cetera. The only, finally, I got something that gave me a link to the outside world. Jody Foster who was the reason that Reagan was shot by, you know, guy who was in love with her, and gas bomb. Couldn't find gas bomb. I wasn't allowed to use the FBI's uh, CTAD anyway. So what the heck does this mean? And in 30 seconds, 29, 28, come on, come on. <laughs> was there gonna be a bomb? Yes. but not at the house in Beverly Hills. At Studio City, of course, it was right in front of you guys. On Ventura Boulevard, yeah, look at these. Look at the Jodie Foster one. What the hell does this mean? Why is Jodie Foster out in the middle of the left? Why do we have this house? Why do we have going to be a gas bomb here and this house? I also studied Swahili demonstratives, so. <laughs> I have an eye for it. Well, I'm glad you asked. A is Jodie Foster's house. B is the house that where the bomb threats were delivered. Oh. It wasn't a letter, it was actually a map. Studio City, Ventura Boulevard or Ventura Freeway, big, big shopping area. You got me. <laughs> All I do is analyze language, lady. <laughs> I, I changed the scale to, to see. I mean, obviously, I wasn't given the, uh, a, a, a Gmail map, I mean, a, a Google map. But it explains why these things are placed the way they were. And no bomb ever went off. He came back, head of security for Jody Foster, came back the next day. He said, oh, that's Joe. Picked up Joe, never talked about it, because he used to do this all the time when in Boston. Hang out with people who protect celebrities if you really want to know that the world is an odd place. All right, thank you very much.